please, please mute yourself as you are joining. Please try to mute your mic, please. All right, so I welcome you all to Word of Accounting Professionals. You know, this institute was established to mitigate or reduce the gap between theory and practice for professional accountants. And it is our responsibility to equip professionals in the field on certain practical aspects that might be required of them at their place of work. And that is why we've been conducting series of trainings. And this one is also part of what we are going to um, abreast ourselves with. So it's an institute where we deal with a lot of um, accountancy, auditing, tax, consultancy, business analysis, business proposals, um, trainings, ICANN lectures. Uh, these are all part of what this institute is known for. And I also have some of my colleagues, which I'm very sure some of them are in this meeting tonight, um, paying close attention to what we are doing. So it's a, it's a privilege that we are all um, here together so we can share knowledge, we can learn, and then we can grow together as a um, professional accountant. So this evening, part of what um, we'll be looking at is um, on payroll management. Because um, we've, we've gotten lots of um, feedbacks, comments from professional colleagues that um, we need to bring in trainings on payroll. And um, that is why we have scheduled these meetings for interested participants. So if you have any question as the class is going on, please just put down your question. Um, we are going to attend to all questions at the end of this section. So let me share my screen. Um, okay, before I proceed, sorry, I forgot to mention my name. My name is Otonel Moni. Um, a chartered accountant in, in this profession. All right. Please, when you can see my screen, just um, let me know. Okay, I can see your screen. Can you all see my screen now? Yes, I can. I can. Every other person, please confirm you all can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. All right. Thank you very much. So, like I said, if you have any question, just put down your question and then we would answer all of them at the end of the class. So um, tonight we'll be looking at payroll management and I'm very sure most of us here, we handle payroll in our various organizations. And you would agree with me, please, please mute your mic so we can hear ourselves. Please mute your mic. Thank you very much. So you would agree with me that payroll is a very, very important um, aspect in every organization because one of the things that employees look up to at the end of the month is their salary. And salary also has a regulation that must be properly followed. You know, and most of what we find in various companies today is some companies are not in compliance with payroll management. For one reason or the other, companies just try as much as possible to boycott um, 
the what they are supposed to do in terms of payroll. And so as a professional accountant, our duty, one of our duty is that we bring in stability. We bring in balance to companies who are um, avoiding what they are supposed to do because some companies don't even pay tax at all. And it is part of what we are supposed to do as professional accountant. We have to ensure that we are in compliance in payment of tax and every other duties that are assigned to payroll. So this evening, we'll look at how payee is being computed. You know, there are other um, regulations that guide payroll. Apart from payee, we also have pension. We also have um, NHIS. We also have um, NHF, depending on the particular one that your company is um, into. And mostly, you would, you would agree with me that private companies, most private companies, what they majorly take care of is payee and pension. And that is because other regulations like NHIS, NHF, and every hey, other one are not mandatory. They are not mandatory for private organizations. You mostly find this in a public sector. Public sector are the ones that, you know, they take cognizance of NHIS and all of those deductions and they take it from the, the um, gross involvement of every employee. But private sectors, what they are majorly concerned about is pension and pay. So that is what we are going to regulate this class to. Um, we are regulating um, pay and pension. Every other thing is being constant. Sorry, let me admit. Please mute yourself as you are coming in. So um, we are limiting our calculations this evening to the and, uh, pension remittance. So now, what are the things to note? What are the things to do when you prepare payee or payroll for your company? Now, we'll look at, um, at maybe one to five um, examples for clarity and a better understanding. So let's assume we have, um, let me just use any name here. We have um, Sadiq. Sadiq Olalekon as our employee. And the basic salary for this particular staff is, let's say, 500,000. Mind you, there is no um, stipulated rates on how basic transport and housing um, rates are being calculated. Companies adopt whatever policy that suits, that suits them. So let's assume this particular staff, the transport allowance is 700,000. And the um, housing allowance is 400. No, let me use one. Please, as you, are going, as you are joining the class, please mute your mic. Please mute your mic. Please mute your mic. So um, we'll be calculating based on the new finance act this evening. Our calculations will be based on the new finance act because the finance act has made certain changes to uh, payroll. So I would advise that we pay close attention to what we are doing here so that we can properly um, put this at our various place of work. So once we, 
please, as you are joining the class, please mute your mic. So, having done this, it means that the annual gross income for this particular staff is the combination of both the basic allowance, basic salary rather, transport allowance, and then housing allowance. So that is the summation of this. Of this and this. So that will give us an annual gross income of 2.4 million. So let's assume this particular staff to get the monthly gross. Just divide the annual gross income by 12. By 12. So it means this particular staff is gross pay every month is 200,000. This particular staff, Mr. Lalekon, is earning 200,000. Now, how are we going to deduct the pension and tax from this particular salary for Olaliko? Pension is 8% um, for every employee and 10% for employers. So for employee, you will take 8% of his annual gross because we are basing this calculation on the gross income. When we are done, we will now split it down into um, the monthly net of the particular staff. So you take 8% of the gross annual gross income. So that will give us 8%. This is our annual gross income, which is 2.4 million, multiplied by 8%. 8% is 0 0.08. So once you do that, it means the annual pension that you are supposed, or the employer is supposed to deduct from the okay. annual gross income of this particular staff is 192,000. 192,000 is the pension that the employee will remit for a whole year. So now we're going to get our new gross income. We are going to get our new gross income and that is the deduction of the pension from your annual gross income. So that will give us your annual gross income, which is 2.4 minus your annual pension. So it means the new gross income for this particular staff is 2,208,000. I'm going to show us, as we continue in the class, I'm going to show us the difference between the old finance act and the new finance act in terms of the computation of um, payroll. I'm going to show us the slight changes that was made so that we can also take note of it and then we put in necessary measures at our various place of work. So we, are, we have gotten our new gross income to be 2208000 The next thing to do is to deduct your consolidated relief allowance. Consolidated relief allowance are uh, allowances or relief that all employees are entitled to. So you are you are to remit it or you are to deduct it from their gross income. It's like a benefit. It's a relief that is granted to every employee. So your consolidated relief allowance is calculated in this format: the IR of two hundred thousand or 1% of annual gross income. Please take note, 1% of annual gross income. Your annual gross income is this, your 2.4. Annual gross income is different from your new gross income. I'm going to show you where we are to, where we are to make use of both um, income. So, but when you are calculating your, when you are calculating for your consolidated relief allowance, According to the new finance act, it is your IR of 200,000 or 1% of annual gross income. So let's do 1% of our annual gross income and see which of them is higher. 1% of our annual gross income, 1% is 0 0.01. So that will be 0 0.01 multiplied by your annual gross income, which is this. Please mute your mic as you are coming in. Please mute your mic so we can all hear ourselves.
So let's take out our 1% of our annual gross income. 1% of our annual gross income. That will give us how much? That is 24,000. So you would agree with me that 200,000 is higher than 24,000. Is that not so? That is so. 200,000 is higher than 24,000. So definitely we are going with the 200,000 because the law says you should take the higher of them. Which of them is higher? So our consolidated relief allowance in this case will be 200, 200,000. So 200,000, the next thing is to do is, the law says that higher of 200,000 or 1% annual gross income plus 20% of your new gross income. So this is where you are making use of the new gross income. Initially, in the Finance Act 2019, what was stipulated in the act is that this plus 20 percent would be on your annual gross income which is your agi so in the old finance act after you've calculated for your ir of 200,000 or one percent of annual gross income plus 20 percent of annual gross income that is what was done in the old finance act but according to the new finance act, changes has been made. And the reason for that change is because, let me explain that. Let me explain the reason for the change. You know, pension is not taxable. Pension has its own law that is separate. So the argument was that if you have taken pension from your annual gross income, why would you base your relief on that same pension? Because normally, pension is a different regulation entirely. So your relief shouldn't be based inclusive of pension. Because when you do 20% of your annual gross income, it is inclusive of your pension, which isn't supposed to be. So the new Finance Act said that your 20% must be based on your new gross income. That is the changes okay. that has been made based on the new. Please, are as you are coming there? in, mute yourself. As you are coming in, please, can you mute your mic? So we can hold here. Okay. Okay. I will suggest to mute everybody. Yes, I have done that now. I hope everyone can hear me. Can everyone hear yes. me? I hear you, yes, go on. All right, thank yes, you very we can much. Hear you. So I was explaining the changes. So the changes is that your 20% would be based on, your 20% will be based on your new gross income. It wouldn't be based on your annual gross income. So the mistake that most professional accountants, the mistake that they do is that they still base their computation on the old finance act. And that shouldn't supposed to be. Your computation, your 20% your would be on the new gross income, not on your annual gross income. Please let's take note of these changes. So our 20% on the new gross income our twenty percent on the new gross income that would give us uh, that is twenty percent. That's zero point two multiplied by your new gross income. This is your new gross income, which is two million two hundred and eight thousand, and that will give us um, four hundred and forty one thousand six hundred. So after you've gotten your consolidated relief allowance, the next thing is to calculate your taxable income. And how do you do that? Your taxable income is your new gross income minus your consolidated relief allowance. So your new gross income in this case, 
we have um, that will give us this minus this minus this. So our taxable income is one million five hundred and sixty-six thousand four hundred. So this is what we are going to base this particular employee on the personal income tax act. So we are going to apply the PIT rate to the taxable income for this particular for this particular staff. And for the PIT rate, I have the rates put down here. Let me um can you take that taxable income again? What do you say? The taxable income you got, that 1.5, can you take it again, please? Okay. So what I said is, your taxable income is, your new gross income, which is this amount, deduct the relief allowance that you've calculated. You know, we have our relief allowance is 200,000, which is the higher, which is higher than 1% that we took, plus 20% of the new gross income. So when we did the 20% of the new gross income, that gave us 441,600. So our taxable income is your new gross income minus your allowances. So that will be this minus this minus this. That will give us our taxable income of 1,566,400. Do we get that? Yes. All right. Thank you very much. So I've all done that. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I said I, I have a question, please. Okay, I would suggest, I would suggest, um, okay, go ahead with your question. Okay, uh, regarding these uh, annual gross income and new gross income, if, for example, maybe we have a pension, uh, now we have pension here, if, for example, maybe we have NHM and NHIS, are we supposed to apply it before we get our new gross income? So if you are yes, you will apply it. So your your NHF okay. is your NHF is um, two percent two point five percent on your basic salary. So yeah. if you have NHF, for instance, if your company is um, regulated to deduct that, um, you will take out your NHF. That will be two point five of your basic salary. Two point five of this, you have it. You will put it here. If you also have NHIS. NHIS, I think, um, is 10% for employer and then 5% for employee. So you also do your 5% on your annual gross income for NHIS. You take it there before you arrive at your new gross income. Do we get that? Can I yes, yes. Well, well, yes, yes. All right, thank you very much. So having done that, the next thing is to apply your um, PIT rate on your taxable income. You would apply your PIT rate on your taxable income. Now, for your PIT for your PIT rate, the law says that the first three hundred should be subjected to seven percent tax. So, how do we do that? You bring out your taxable income. Let me put it here. Um, okay, let me make it simpler for us. Your taxable income, the first one is 300,000 at 7%. 300,000 at 7%, that would give us, um, so that would be, is equals to 300,000 multiplied by 7%, that's 0 0.07. So that is 21,000. 21,000. So you move to the next. The next 300,000 will be subjected to 11% 11 rate. So that will be the next 300. 
the next 300 at 11 percent that is 0 0.1 0 0.11 that will give us 33,000. so the next 500 will be subjected to 15 percent so your 15 percent that will give us 500,000 multiplied by 0 0.15 that is 75,000. So before we proceed, let's ensure that we are in agreement with our taxable income. Our taxable income is 1,566,400. Now we've done for one, two, three. We are going to take out, take out this. Let me bring this down here. You take it from your taxable income. So you know what is left. So you shouldn't go above what you are calculating. So let's say this is 1,566,400. So 1,566,400. If you take out 300, 300, 300, that is 1.1. If you take out 1.1 that we've calculated from this amount, sorry. Um, if you take out 1.1 that we've calculated, we are left with 400 and we are left with 466,400 naira. And the next calculation we are going to is the next 500. So what you are going to do is that you subject the balance, the balance which is remaining, you will subject it to 19% PIT rate. So here now we are going to calculate it to be, is that will be equals to 466,400 multiply by 19 percent that is 0 0.19 that is 0 0.19 so it means the balance which is this will give us this amount so our taxable pay or our tax payable for this particular employee is the summation of all of these so some all the pit workings that you've calculated some everything that would give us um, that would give us a sum of um, that's 217616. So that will form our tax payable. That will form our tax tax payable. So our tax payable here is 217616. So that's our tax, tax payable. Now, the law also says that you should calculate minimum tax. So whether or not um, you are preparing or you are calculating your payee, you must calculate minimum tax. And your minimum tax is 1% of your annual gross income. The reason why we make use of minimum tax is that if, for instance, you have any case, you know, the our minimum wage in Nigeria is 30,000 Naira. Any staff who is earning below 30,000 Naira will not be subjected to um, tax. But staff that are earning above 30,000 Naira, you will subject them to tax. But when you subject those kind of um, employee to tax, you will discover that they are basic or you discover that their taxable income, some of them would not be up to 300,000. It might be, but in a situation where you have any staff whom you cannot apply the personal income tax rate, that is, they are, you cannot charge them based on PIT rates. The law says that you should charge them on minimum tax. So that is why we are going to put down our minimum tax here. So our minimum tax computation is 1% of your annual gross income. So 1% is 0 0.01 multiplied by our annual gross income is this, which is 2.4. So 1% of that, that will give us um, 24,000. So you will tax them on the tax authority. When it comes to the tax authority, the tax authority will take the higher of the two the higher of the minimum tax and the tax payable, which is definitely the tax, tax payable.
So we'll be charging this employee based on our tax, our tax payable. So how to now calculate what is left after deducting your tax payable from this, from your taxable income. Our, our net annual pay now would be this minus this. So it means after taking out every other thing, this is what we have. So you now divide this on a monthly basis so that you know how much, you will know how much this particular staff would earn at the end of the at the end of the month. So that will give us this divided by 12 so that you know what you are to pay to this particular staff every every month. No, that is sorry, is this? That will be uh, this, your new gross income minus your tax payable. Your new gross income minus your tax, tax payable. So to get our monthly payee, our monthly payee with your tax payable divided by 12. That's what will be our monthly payee. So this is our tax payable divided by 12. You know how much that particular staff. And then your monthly pension, your monthly pension is your annual pension divided by 12. That is this minus this, sorry, this divided by 12. That is 16,000. So when we add, let's confirm if our calculation is uh, accurate. When you take out, let's add this. Plus this. Plus this. Sorry, just a minute. So this is, let's remove that. So our net monthly is, uh, our net monthly is 16,000. Minus this. So, sorry, our net monthly, our net monthly is supposed to be, okay, this minus this, that will give us this. So divide this by 12. Let me create a column. Let me create a column. So we know this is, so this is uh, our annual, our annual pay. Annual net pay. So our net monthly is. Uh, so if you want to know the take home that this particular staff will be going on, it's divide this by 12. 165. So 165, let's confirm our figure. If you add, if you add this, was your pension. This you can see is equal to the two hundred thousand that the particular staff is earning monthly. So this the gross salary, the gross monthly, or the the monthly gross of that particular staff, you know, is this two hundred thousand. So it means this particular staff that is earning 200,000 every month, after taking out your payee and pension, 
the particular staff will be going home with 165,865 naira 33 kobo every month. So your net, your monthly pension is 16,000 naira. That is what you'll be remitting on behalf of that employee. And then your monthly payee would also be 18,134.67. So the net monthly for that particular staff, the take home after um, deduction of your pension and payee is 165,865. So that is that for that particular employee. Now let's look at another example for better understanding of how this calculation is done. Let's assume we have another employee called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Emmanuel Sandra. The basic salary of Emmanuel Sandra is, let's say, 600,000. Transport, 800,000. And then your housing allowance, let's assume, is a um, 1.5, 1.5. So your gross income, your annual gross income for this particular staff will be the summation of your basic plus your transport plus your housing allowance. That is your annual, annual gross income. So that is 2.9. No, I want a figure that is higher than 2.9. I want a figure that is giving us like 5 million plus. Let me make this to 2 million there. Okay. So our annual gross income for Emmanuel is 4 million 100,000. So what's the monthly gross? Your monthly gross is your annual gross income divided by 12. So this particular staff, the gross, the gross salary of this particular staff is 341,666.67. Now let's calculate our pension from this. Our pension will be based on the annual gross income. Pension is 8% for employee and 10% for employer. So for employee now, you do 8%, that is 0 0.08, multiply by your annual gross income. That will be 332, three, uh, 328,000. So your Hello, new sir. gross income. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, sorry, I, I wanted to ask that this pension of 18, is it no longer 8% um, on basic housing and transport again? Or uh, has it changed according to the new finance tax? No, it's still, it's still, it's still. Um, the same thing based on what we have here normally your your company can decide to have more than basic transport and housing allowance there could be several allowances there you could see utilities and every other thing whatever allowances that the company is computing for you the when you add up everything together to get your annual gross income it is on that annual gross income that you will calculate your pension it's not on mostly basic transport and housing. Companies just regulate because there is no, there is no um, law that stipulates the allowances that you have. So what most companies do is that they, they just restrict their um, payroll computation or the splitting of their annual gross income, they restrict it to basic transport and housing. And that's why most people think your pension is on that three, it's not on the three whatever allowances that the company has computed for you to get your gross income. It is on that gross income that you calculate your pension of 8%. You get, but for this particular illustration or for this particular training, we have restricted our calculations to these three basic housing and transport. Okay. Um, so, hello, sir. Okay. Hello. Uh, thank you very much. Second thing is that what about a situation whereby some companies, um, the employer pay like for instance they pay NHS, NH, NHF, National Housing Fund. Then there is another the uh, allowances like and um, NHIF. 
that okay. how are you going to compute that in this particular um okay so i i think i, I explained that in the first example so when you find yourself in a company that deducts nhis nhf nhf is 2.5 percent of your basic salary so what you will do is let's assume there is nhf what you would do let me create a column I would remove it. So what you would do is NHF. Okay, no, let me put it here. Let me put it here. Um, let me put it here. So let's assume there is NHF. and NHIS, let's use NHF for instance. Your NHF is 2.5% of your basic salary. So that will be 2.5%, 2.5% is 0 0.025. Multiply it by your basic salary. You know, this is your basic salary. This is your annual basic salary. This is your annual basic salary that has been structured here. So multiply sure, yeah. it on your annual basic salary. So your NHF deduction for that particular year is 15,000 Naira. That is what you have to deduct per annum for that particular staff. Now, to now get your gross income, to now get your gross income, it would be, it would be your, sorry, to get your new gross income, let's assume we've calculated our annual gross income to be this, monthly to be this. Then we've deducted pension, we've deducted NHF. Your new, your new gross income will now be your annual gross income. You take out any relief, any um, regulatory deductions that you make, you take it out from your annual gross income. So you take it out from minus, that will give us minus this, and then minus your NHF. If there, is, if there is any other deduction, any other regulatory deduction that was taken out, you will take it out before calculating your relief allowance. So if you have NHF, NHIS, ITF, whichever one your company is into, take it out before calculating your what? Your new gross income. New gross so income. Okay. At the end of okay. the month, at the end of the month, to, do, to know what you'll be remitting per month to NHF, to know what you'll be remitting to the Federal Mortgage Bank, you will divide your, your NHF by 12. So let's assume, let's create an instance here. That will be this divided by 12. So it means on this particular staff, on his basic salary, you know, this is your basic salary. You take out, you'll be remitting 1,250 Naira to Federal Mortgage Bank for NHF. And if it is for NHIS, you will remit it to the relevant tax authority. So that's the that's for the instance where you have any other any other regulatory deduction. So one thing you should always take note of is that if there is any other regulatory deduction aside pension, make sure you deduct it before arriving at your what new gross income. Once you arrive at your new mm -hmm. gross income, then you can now deduct your consolidated relief allowance from your new gross income after applying the necessary um, rules and regulation. Is it clear? Okay, Elisa, could that be the reason why some companies separated the basic transport and housing? Yes, Just for exactly. them to yes, get so, the accurate so, so, um, Yes, exactly. So some companies, some companies separate it and they don't take NHF. They don't take NHIS. Some companies, they separate it and they take NHF, they take an NHIF. It is why you do that most of the time is for transparency sake. It's so that employee will see that yes, there are certain allowance that has been provided for them, you know? Though that is the total package is what the company will give to you, but they will break it down for you so that you will see the, how, how transparent they are. And if the company is remitting NHF and all of that, it could be one of the reasons why they break it, but it is always advisable. It is always advisable you break it down into this particular segment so that 
for transparency sake, and if you have any other deductions you take from it, you take from it and then you remit. Is it clear? Can yeah, I yeah, very, yes, sir. Very well. Thank you. You can proceed. It's clear. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, um, so let me remove this. Uh, not, uh, so, once you apply your 8% on your annual gross income, you have your pension. So from your pension to arrive at your new gross income, you take out, you take out your annual gross income, you take out the pension amount from it. So it means we are, our new gross income is this. So it is on this basis, we are now going to deduct consolidated relief allowance for this particular staff. So the law so says that- to... Okay, sorry, sorry to cut you so short. So sorry to cut you. I want to say that why didn't you why didn't you leave the statutory deduction? Why didn't you leave it instead of you removing so that we know those statutory deduction, how they are being applied on the payroll as well, instead of you removing it. And, and then you will be able to know the consolidated, the total packaging of the consolidated relief allowance too. Okay. And it's just a suggestion, Sha. Okay, um, okay, it's a good one. I believe you are getting have, this file, uh, sir. Immediately after, all right, let me let me let me use this example to include NHF just for some some companies who are some of you that might find yourself in companies that take NHF. Okay, um, so the implication of having NHF is that, you know, is that will reduce the uh, monthly salary, the monthly gross for that particular staff. Or the monthly, because you are taking that money from, you are taking that money from the total package of that employee. So let's, do that. So we have taken this minus this minus this. So we have this. So this will become our new gross income. So once you have your new gross income, it's still the same application. Whatever um, deduction you are taking, let's assume we also have, let's assume we also have NHIS. This is 2.5%. This is 2.5%. Let me put it here. 2.5%. So your NHIS is 5%. Um, 5% and the employer contributes 10%. So let me say. So the reason why employers don't usually do this, apart from most governmental um, companies, is because your private organizations most of the time they take care of your HMO. Your private organizations, they have HMO specifically made for their staff. So, and the, this um, cost, the cost of HMO is borne by the employer directly. So there is no point deducting again NHIS from employee salary and at the same time still provide HMO service or provide HMO for them. So that is why you will discover that most private organizations they don't really, because it's not mandatory, they don't really deduct some of this from the employee. Rather, they go with HMO. It is only public sector that take cognizance of this, um, most public sector rather, that take cognizance of this um, NHIS and other deductions and the likes. But private sector, they don't have time. So, but whichever way, let's assume this is, NHIS is 5%. So 5% of your annual gross income, that will give us 5% is 0 0.05 multiply by, multiply by your annual gross income, which is this. So that will give us 205,000. So our gross income, our new gross income will change. That will be 
your annual gross minus your pension minus NHIS minus NHF. So our new gross income is this. So it is on this basis that you would apply your consolidated relief allowance. So your consolidated relief allowance, the law says that you should take the IR of 200,000 IR of 200,000 or 1% of gross income. IR of 200,000 or 1% of gross income. So let's assume, let's do our computation here. Our 1% of gross income. So that will be 1% is 0 0.01 multiplied by our annual gross income, let's see if it is higher than 200,000. If it is not higher, so we have 41,000. So of course it's not higher than 200,000. So we definitely go with 200,000. So in this case, we have 200,000 here, which is higher than 1% of gross income. And then plus the relief allowance is also inclusive of 20% of your new gross income which is this amount the new hello, finance sir. act hello sorry to disturb you sir okay go ahead this, uh, this nhis the five percent is on which of the is it basic or transport or housing no on everything on the basic transport and housing on your annual gross income what of the nhf your nhf is on basic that one is on basic. Let me put it here, 2.5% of basic salary. Okay. So that's on 2.5% of your basic. So NHF is on basic, but your NHIS is on the annual gross income. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, so, so once we, once we have done that, the next thing is to, the law says that your relief should also be inclusive of 20% of new gross income. Prior to the Finance Act 2020 that made adjustment to this, Finance Act 2019, the computation that was done in that act is that your 20%, I'm referring to the Finance Act, the old Finance Act now, normally, it is your 20% is on your annual gross income. Is on this, is on your annual gross income, which is this amount. But the new finance act have made certain adjustments to that. And why is that so? The reason for that adjustment, the argument was, if you, if you, you can't relieve on a regulatory or a mandatory um, remittance, so for, for instance, when you take out 20%, 20% is 0 0.2 multiplied by your annual gross income. You know this, your annual gross income is inclusive of your pension, your NHF, your NHIS, and any other remit, any other regulatory deductions that you have to do. And in that case, the relief that you will be granting to that particular staff would be higher. Meanwhile, the staff has already enjoyed or the staff is already enjoying those relief that you've remitted on his or her behalf. So it's like you are, it's like a double relief. It's like you are granting that staff a double relief. It's like double taxation. But in this case, it's not taxation, but it's like a double relief. Because if you compute your 20% on your annual gross income, which is inclusive of your pension, NHIF, and everything, the relief that you'll be granting to that staff would be very, very high. And the staff is already enjoying this. So there is no need for you um, applying that 20% on your annual gross income. So the new Finance Act 2020 made adjustments to that double relief by saying that your 20% should be on your what? On your new gross income. So once you take out the 20% on your new gross income, this is what you are going, this is the true position. All of this, relief that the, that the staff is enjoying, plus the 
pension and regulatory compliance. These are the total package that you would deduct from the gross income of that particular staff. You are not supposed to use it, your 20%, on the annual, excuse me, on the annual gross income. That is why, that is the adjustment that the new Finance Act has provided. And so, professional accountants, most of, we must take cognizance of this new, this new rules that has been given because we are not expected to prepare our payroll based on the old act, but rather we are expected to prepare it based on the adjustments, the adjustment that has been made by, by the act. So in this case, I mean, let me check something. Um, you have, um, let me see. All right, let's proceed. So in this case, you have uh, our taxable income would now be your new gross income minus your new gross income minus your consolidated relief allowance. So you, this is our taxable income. So it is on this taxable income that would apply the personal income tax rates. So your PIT rate is, let me bring this here. Your PIT rate, that would give us So the PIT rate is first 300 will be charged as 7%. So your 300,000, 0.07, that will give us 21,000. The next 300,000 will be charged at 11%. 11, 11 the next 300,000 will be charged at 11%. So you do 11% here. That will give us 300,000. Eleven percent is 0 0.11. So that will give us 33,000. So the next 500, the next 500, that will give us 500,000. Next 500 will be charged at 15%, which is 0 0.15. So you have uh, 75,000. So the next 500 will be charged at 19%. That's 0 0.19. So that will give us 95,000. So just to be sure that we are on track, you will take out, we've done for 300, 300, 500, 500. I think that is 1.6. So you take out 1.6 from our taxable income. So let's know what is available, what is left, so that we'll know where to place the appropriate PIT rate. So let's take this, that will be this minus 1.6. That will give you, so we are left with 1,041,600. We are left with 1,041,600. So in this case now, the next is to the next one thousand one million six hundred thousand will be charged at twenty one percent. So it means that the balance that we have is what we are going to charge at twenty one percent. So that will be this balance multiplied by twenty one percent. So that will be zero point two one. So this is. 218736. So 218736, that is our tax on that particular item. So now let's sum up our tax payable together, which is the addition of all of this. That would give us 400 and 442,736. So our taxable our tax payable is 400 
and 42,736. So the, the law also mandates you to calculate for your minimum tax. Okay, Emmanuel, go ahead. Okay, good evening, sir. Good, right, good evening. Yeah, Um. please. Okay, possibly maybe by the time you finish this stage, there is a place I'm not getting. I think after the new gross income, um, after the place, I understood it vividly to the place where you, you, you remove the deductions like the NA. Hello, Emmanuel, are you there? Can everybody hear Emmanuel? Okay, am I the only one not hearing Emmanuel or is a... Uh... No, me, I can't hear him from my side. We, we all can't hear Emmanuel. Okay, maybe when he comes back, he would, um, he would go on with his question. So this is our taxable, our tax payable. So the law also mandates you to calculate minimum tax. So minimum tax is 1% of your annual gross income. So 1% of your annual gross income, that is 0 0.01 multiplied by your annual gross income is this. This is your annual gross income. So that, that is, so our minimum tax is 41,000. So the, the tax authority will take the IR of your tax payable and the minimum tax, of course is the tax payable that would definitely be higher. So that is, that will give us, so that will give us this. Hello, sir. Yeah, Emmanuel, Hello, are you back? No, it's not Emmanuel. It's okay. Yoni. I would like to ask that since the tax authority will select the higher tax payable, between the minimum and the, um, the the appropriate tax. Why are we now computing the minimum tax payable in the first instance? Yes, it is mandatory you compute minimum tax. It's a law, it's a requirement. And most of the time, you might have situations where the new gross income or the taxable income of a particular employee will not fit in, into the PIT, PIT rate. You know, the PIT rate starts from first 300. So you might have an instance where the taxable income would not be three, up to 300,000, you know? So that doesn't mean that, that that particular employee will not pay tax. That particular employee would still pay tax, mm -hmm. but that staff would be charged on minimum tax. So let's assume, let's assume, okay, maybe we'll take one example where We'll take one example where the taxable income of that particular staff is not up to um, the PIT applications. And then you see where the minimum tax comes in. But nevertheless, the law mandates you to calculate for minimum tax because so staff that earn above the minimum wage, but their, their taxable income is not up to, is not up to the PIT rate which is from 300,000 and above, you will charge such employee on minimum tax. That's why you calculate for minimum tax. Is, is it clear? Can I proceed? Um, yes, yes, you can proceed, sir. Because I lost it for some seconds, but you can proceed. <laughs> Please let's meet our mic as we are coming in. All right, so, um, where am I? Okay, so once you have done that, your annual net pay, your annual net pay would now be, your annual net pay would be, 
um, so your new gross income minus your tax payable. So that would give us your new gross income is this minus your tax payable, which is this. So this is your annual net pay. David, you are raising up your hand. Go ahead. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Yeah, I missed that aspect of a uh, minimal minimal task, which is uh, that 1% of uh, gross income. I wanted to know how you uh, got that uh, 41,000. Okay, so it is 1% of your annual gross income. This is your this is your annual gross income here. Yeah. This is your annual gross okay. income, which is 4.1. So okay. one percent, one percent of it is what we calculate to get your your minimum tax. So that will give us forty one thousand. Okay. All right. So. Hello, sir. Sorry to take you back. I'm so sorry. I needed to. I needed the clarification on this minimum tax. The minimum okay. tax, you, you, yes, you completed there is on one percent on the annual gross income. If I'm right, yes. Now, why not on the on the new gross income? Because I can see from here that even the tax taxable income you completed is on the new gross income. Okay, it is. I don't a know law. if you get my question. Yes, I I understand you. So. It's a law. That's the law that your one percent should be on your annual gross income. So everything we are doing here are all based on laws. They are all based on regulations that we we uh, companies are mandated to oblige to. So we have not formed anything here, but rather we have only worked by the stipulated rules and regulation. So for this year, for the um, taxable income, how we arrive at our taxable income, that is your new gross income minus your consolidated relief allowance. That is what the new finance act says we should calculate our pay on. So everything is a law. So it's not like um, you know, on this particular aspect, we use annual gross income. On this particular aspect, we use gross income no, it's a law, and you must follow what the law has stipulated for you. And that is why when you, when you do not do what is required of you, you might be fined for, um, you, might be, you, might, you might have to pay penalty at the end of the day when you do not follow the necessary or the applicable laws that have been stipulated for payroll. You get, so it's a law that we are following. Is it clear? Yes, yes, it's clear. You can go on. All right. So, so to get our net monthly, to get our net monthly, you divide, divide your annual net pay by 12. You divide your annual net pay by 12. So that will be this divided by 12. So this is, 259. Now let's divide our monthly payee. Our monthly payee is your taxable pay divided by 12. Let me just drag this down. So that is your tax payable divided by 12. And also your pension. Your pension is your annual pension divided by 12. So I'm coming left. I want to check something here. That is 341. Let me complete. Let me first. So let's cross check. I know something is missing. And I will tell you that's because we've applied NHIS and all of that. Coming, does this plus this. So that is three, three twenty three, three three three, and on a normal basis, the monthly gross, 
is um, 341. This is a monthly gross. 341,000. So now, let me add, let me add this. I'm coming and I need to. So, so the reason why is not amounting up to amounting up to the monthly gross is normally a monthly gross should be because of the NHF and NHIF that we've calculated, our monthly growth should be this. I mean, let me check. This is this is I hope I'm right with my computer. So this minus this plus this plus this that should give us three two three. Um, is it seven? Are you going to divide the NHS by so, twelve? And is somebody saying something? Yeah, trying to get the monthly gross um total. Maybe we divide the NHS by 12 and NHIF by 12 to add to this to yes. get the... Yeah, that's what I want to do now. So that's why it's not balancing up because we've added, mm -hmm. we've added this. Let me... So if this is divided by 12, this divided by 12, and this divided by 12, let me see, this divided by 12. So let's so deduct so add all of this together now. So plus this amount plus this So you can see when you take out all the deductions, you will definitely arrive at the gross income for that you can see this is our gross income which is 341,666.67 so when you take out your nh whatever deductions that you took out your final answer must give you your gross pay and that would be that would be so let me make it very simple here because we've added because we've added um, NHIS and NHF. So let's have monthly, because we have monthly payee, monthly pension, let's have monthly NHIF and then monthly, monthly NHF. So in that case now, our monthly, um, our monthly NHF, or let me start with NHIF. That will be your NHIF amount. You know, this is our gross. This is the total package that you have to pay. So you divide this 
divided by 12. So it means our monthly um, our monthly NHF is 1,250,000. That is what you have to remit monthly to the federal mortgage. Why NHIS? Our monthly NHIS now will be your NHIS amount, which is this divided by 12. So that will give us this. So to now know your, so that is when you add up or when you add up everything, when you add all of this together, it must give you your gross, your gross income. It must give you your gross income. So that shows that this particular staff that is earning 341,666 per 0.67 every month, after taking out all deductions from it, the staff will be going home with a net monthly of 259,000, 259,105.33. So that is that. That is that on when you find yourself in a situation where NHF and NHIS is being calculated. Let's take one more. Um, example. Let's take one more calculation. Um, Excuse for... me. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I have a question. Can you please explain the taxable income? How do we get a taxable income? Can you click on it so I can see the formula you use? Okay, so for the taxable income, for the taxable income, which is where is our taxable? These are taxable income. So your taxable income is your new gross income minus your consolidated relief allowance. Don't forget your consolidated relief allowance is higher of 200,000 or 1% of your annual gross income based on the new finance act plus 20% of new gross income based on the new finance act. So when you deduct two of them, when you deduct all relief from your new gross income, you would arrive at your taxable income. So the taxable income is what you will subject to the PIT rates. Is it clear? Yes, it is. Thank you, sir. All right. So uh, one other question, sir. So when you do your tax payable, which of the amounts do you use? And do you need the, the new gross income or which amount do you use to do the first 300, second 300 and first 500? Is your tax, your taxable income. That is where you are taking out the first 300. So you are deducting it as you are taking the first 300. When you say the first 300, what it means is that you have removed 300,000 from your taxable income to apply. So whatever amount you are applying on your PIT, you are deducting it directly from your taxable income. So the first 300 now, what it means is that, what it means is that this, your taxable income minus that 300 that you have calculated for. So it means after we do our first 300, we are left with a balance of 2,341,600. When you do the next 300, what it means is that from the balance that is left, we have also taken 300,000 from it. So what that should give us is this one minus 300. So whatever you are applying the taxable, um, your PIT rate on, the amount you are deducting it from your taxable income gradually. So the next 500 now, it means that you have from this balance, you have also taken 500 from it. So that will be this balance minus 500,000. So that will give us, it means we now have a balance of this. So it means from the next 500 also, it means from this balance, we have taken 500,000 from it. So that will be this balance minus 500,000. So it means we now have 1,041,600. And the, the next one says, 
next one million six hundred thousand. And mind you, what we have as balance is not up to one point six. So it means all the balance that is left here is what you will charge at twenty one percent. So that is what we did here to to get our taxable pay, which gives us two um, two hundred and eighteen thousand seven three six. So it means at this point we have zero. It means we have exhausted everything that has to do with our taxable income. So once you have exhausted, it means that place is now, you don't have any other thing to apply PIT rate on. You don't have any other thing to apply your PIT rate. So it means you are done with your PIT calculation. So, so just sum up all the calculations that you've done and then you add it to your tax payable. You get your tax payable. Is it clear? Yes, it is. Sir. Thank you. All right. So let's quickly look at one more example quickly before we go into the journal entries um, for the day. Um, is somebody asking a question? All right, so let's look at one more example. Um, let's say this is um, Elizabeth's Sunday. Elizabeth Sunday. Um, let me see. I want to. I want to look for a situation where we are going to apply minimum tax. So Elizabeth Sunday, his basic salary is annual basic salary is uh, let's say two hundred. No, let's say 150,000. Um, transport allowance is 100,000. Wow. And then 100,000 housing allowance. So in this case, we are not applying NHF and NHIS, only pension and payee. So his gross income will now be just put it here. So that will give us his gross income is. 350. His gross income is three. His annual gross income is 350,000. So let me, his monthly gross, let's see if this particular staff should pay tax or not. Whether it, the staff is above minimum tax. So let me just drag down this. Uh, it's not. So the, the staff is earning 29,000 plus. So let me increase this a little. Let me increase this a little to 180. Okay, so it means this particular staff is earning above the minimum wage. So is, the staff can be subjected to tax. So now let's apply the necessary tax. Pension is at 8% of the annual gross income. Um, so 8% of annual gross income, that will give us 30,400. Um, let me leave NHF and NHIF. Let's go to, so our new gross income in this case would be, um, that would give us your annual gross income minus your pension. I want to have a situation where minimum tax can apply. Okay, let's let's proceed. If I don't have a situation, I will come back to this NHF and NHIF and apply. So now let's take out our consolidated. No, sorry, this is supposed to be here. This is So our new gross income is your, our new gross income is uh, your annual gross income. Your annual gross income, this minus your pension. So that is 349. 349. So 
349, let's take out our consolidated relief allowance. Let's take out our consolidated relief allowance. I'm sorry, let me do something. This is So this will be this. So that will be 349,000. So let's take out our relief allowance. That's 200,000. Whichever one is higher, you would agree with me that 200,000 will be higher, but let's confirm. So that will be 1%. 1% is 0 0.01 multiplied by your annual gross income. So that will, your annual gross income is this. So that is 38. So 200,000 is higher. So 200,000 is what we are going to have yet as our relief. And then plus 20% of your new gross income. 20% of your new gross income. So that would be 20%, 0 0.2 multiplied by your new gross income. That, that is this. So that is that will give us 69,920. So to get our taxable pay, it is your what? Your new gross income minus your relief allowance. So that will be this minus this minus this. So that will give us our taxable income is. Please yeah. you yourself. Please okay. Okay. For this connecting. Hello, can you mute yourself? I don't know what I need. I don't know what I need. I don't know what I Hello, sir. Mute everybody. Hello, sir. Mute everybody. Just a minute. Please mute everybody. I don't think this person is just signing. I'm going to do it. 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 All right, so haven't done that now. Now our taxable income is seventy nine thousand six eighty. After taking our relief and and all of that, now let's apply our PIT rate. First three hundred. Is it possible? Can it's we apply first three hundred? It's not possible. No. It's not, it's not possible. Thousand. And this particular employee now is earning above the minimum wage. And the law says that the only time you will not pay tax on behalf of any employee is when that employee earns below the minimum wage. But this particular employee is earning a monthly gross of 31,666,067. ,66, so it means this employee is subjected, is, this employee must be subjected to what? To personal income tax. But the taxable income after taking out all relief could not be applied to the PIT rate. That is where your minimum tax computation now comes in. So let's assume professional accountants who don't have this idea now, they will just feel, okay, because 300, first 300,000, the money is now above 300,000. So what do we do? Is it that that tax, we are not going to remit tax on behalf of that employee? No. That is why you have to calculate your minimum tax. So our minimum tax in this case will be 1% of your annual gross income. 1% is 0 0.01 multiplied by 
your annual gross income. Your annual gross income is this. So 1% of it is what? 3,800. So it means this particular staff, what we'll be paying is 3,800 Naira yearly to this, to the LIRS. So you would also divide it. The way you used to divide, you divide it. Let, let's proceed so I can show you what you do in the next year. So in this case now, to get your annual net, your annual net would be, your annual net pay would now be, since we don't have tax payable, our minimum tax will form our tax payable in this regard. So your annual net will be your new gross income, your new gross income minus your minimum tax. So it means the annual net for this employee is this. So net monthly, net monthly is this. Let me just drag this down. So net monthly is this. Our net payee is, our net payee will now be this. That will be your minimum tax divided by 12. This is the month, net monthly, this is the monthly payee for that particular staff. And then your pension, your pension will be your normal pension calculation divided by 12, divided by 12. So that will be this. So let's confirm our calculation. If it is up to the gross salary of this staff. So that will give us, let me see your, that will give us your net monthly, let's confirm if you are accurate, your net monthly plus your monthly payee plus your monthly pension. So that will give us 31,666.67. You can see that is what this staff is supposed to end. So this monthly gross for this staff is 31,666,067 ,66, cobo. So when you take out your pension and tax, this particular staff will be going home with 28,816,67 cobo. That is that. So we have touched an instance where minimum tax is applicable. We have touched an instance where um, NHIF, NHIS, NHF, and other deductions, aside pension and tax is being, is applied. And also we've also touched an instance where pension and tax alone is applied. So I think we need be able to grab the computation of how payroll is being done. And if you have a situation where you, you prepare payroll for multiple staffs, you have thousands of staffs in your company, the best is to apply Excel formula. The best is to apply Excel formula to formularize all of this computation. You know, you, if, you, if, if you need any um, template as regarding that, you can, private chat me later on it and then but when you if you do payroll for a large company the best you can do is to formularize all of this there's a way you can use excel to formularize all this computation all you just need to do is to put in the figures and it would calculate it would calculate itself so that is that about um Payroll computation. So let's quickly move out to the journal. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. All right. Wait, Go ahead. So I have a question on, on when you're trying to uh, confirm the calculations with the. You fix your monthly gross, then the monthly payee and monthly pension. What did you check it alongside with? Your net pay, your net pay. You know, your net pay means 
net pay means you have deducted things from it. So either you have deducted pension or payee or NHF or any other things that you've deducted. So when you add your net pay plus all deductions that you've done, it will form your gross income. Your gross is that nothing has been deducted from it. That's your gross pay. So when you now deduct those things, the balance that you'll be going home with is your net pay. So when you have your net pay, add up all the deductions that was made on that particular staff. It will give you your gross pay. Okay, thank you. Elisa, Elisa, what about your situation whereby... Um, what do you say? Can you hear me, sir? I can hear you. Go ahead. So what about in the situation whereby in some organization they deduct union staff union fee? They deduct Imagine what? Staff union fee. Maybe you belong to union organizations. Union. Yes. Yes. If so, you after the net pay, there will now be the deduction of that particular. You you know union is not statutory. Yes. Uh -huh. So in that situation, are we going to deduct it from the net pay or? Uh, we are going to include it as part of those allowances. Okay, so in a situation where you have those kind of deductions, union, and maybe um, like some companies, they do have sanctions, sanction and all other offenses that you committed, and those deductions will be done from source. So what you would do in your payroll sheet is that because they are not regulatory, it will, not be, it will not form part of all this calculation. You are going to take that personally with the employee. So you would have a computation, you would have a column that will signify such deduction. For instance, now, let's have a column, let's have a column for, let's have a column wherein um, deductions is being done. And this could be any other kind of deduction, whether sanction, lateness, or you just, or maybe mm. the staff is paying for anything and you want to deduct it from source. So after taking out all the, after taking out all the, um, pay all the deductions, regulatory deductions, then from the net pay of that particular staff, let's assume this staff now is, is, um, the union fee is 10,000 Naira every month that you pay. 10,000 Naira every month. So you would, let me show you something. So let's assume this is 10,000 Naira union fee. So that 10,000 Naira will be deducted from the net pay of that particular employee. So instead of this instance where we did this calculation, you know, this employee is going home with 200 and um, 77,333.33. So when you take out that deduction, when you take out that deduction, this amount will reduce. This amount will reduce to, it will reduce, when you take out 10,000 from it, it will reduce to, um, that will give us, it's just because this is, this has a formula already, but let me just remove the formula. When you deduct, Two seven seven three 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 point three three minus ten thousand that was done. So it means what this staff will be going home with. What this staff will be going home with would be um, what this staff will be going home with will be two hundred and sixty seven thousand three 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 point three three. So confirm if it is equal to your gross pay. So it means you take out this, you sum it up to this equation. You equate it with this. So this addition of all of this, all the deductions, you sum everything, is still going to give you your gross pay of 341,666.67. So what you, would, what you should just take note of is that any calculation or deduction that is to be made that is not a regulatory deduction 
will be done after you've computed your net pay. So you will take it from the net pay of that particular employee, depending on how you formularize your, your payroll sheet. But that is the way it is. So just make sure that whatever deduction you are doing, your formula should link it to the net pay and not on any regulatory payment, not on your new gross income, your basic and all of that. It must not come into that. All these ones, they are regulatory payments on remittance that must be made. But any other deduction, make sure that your formula captures it on your net payment alone. So you take out that deduction from your net payment, you arrive at the new balance that that particular employee would go with. Is it clear? Okay. Very well. Very well, sir. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Hello. Okay. Go ahead. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just want to get a bit of clarification regarding uh, this uh, minimal tax aspect. So I get to know that in, in the third uh, computation, where you have a taxable income of seven. I didn't get your question. That, uh, I said, uh, I just wanted to get a clarification regarding the third computation that you did. Now, okay. in determining in determining the minimum tax now, I noticed that, okay, for the third um, uh, example there, we have a taxable income of 79,618. Now, which falls within, within uh, the first 300,000 based on the tax table? Now, in essence, is it that, what are we considering for the minimum tax? Is it when the mean the taxable income is not up to three hundred thousand, when the taxable income is not up to three hundred thousand, just like we have seventy nine six eighty, that was when we conclude that okay, we are going to charge minimum tax. Oh yes, so that's that's one yes, but two is yeah on the norms. Even though even though the taxable income is above three hundred thousand, you would have yeah. your minimum tax. So okay. your minimum tax and the tax payable, the tax authority will select the one that is higher because those people too, they are looking for higher revenue. So they will select the one that is higher. So it's not that the only time minimum tax computation will come into place as the payment of tax that an employee would pay is when one instance is when the minimum tax is higher than the tax payable. Let's assume after computing our 1% of annual gross income, our minimum tax is 300,000. In this case, let's assume our minimum tax is 300,000. You can see your minimum tax is higher than your tax payable. Yeah. So in that case, you will subject that tax to minimum tax payments. So okay. we don't, it's not only on the instance where the taxable pay is not up to 300,000. That's number one instance. The second instance is when your minimum tax is above your tax payable. You will charge the employee based on your minimum tax. So that is how you would apply minimum tax rate. But most of the time, most of the time, your 1% of annual gross income is never up to your tax payable. So that is why tax payable is always used. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't consider okay. both of them. You should put both of them side by side, which are, because you might have an instance where somebody who is earning billions of naira in amortization, for example, directors and directors who work in a, in Chevron, for instance, that earns a lot. You would agree with me that such director might have an annual gross income that is very very huge, and when you compute the annual gross income of such person, you might be having higher minimum tax. So do not neglect it, but compare it on the basis of, is it higher than the tax payable? If it is not higher, you take the tax payable. And when your taxable income is not up to 300,000, you pick your minimum tax as your tax payment. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 uh... So, sorry, does it uh, the last question? I think based on what I've uh, learned so far, uh, I noticed that in comparing the 
the finance act changes that was made to the PE. You know, for the old method, is when we have all those uh, deductions, when you have all your annual gross list or deduction, including the consolidated labor, the pension, the, pay, uh, the pension, the NHF and NHIS and consolidated labor allowance, then you have your what? Your taxable income. So what I noticed here is that based on what you did here now is that, okay, we, we need to net all those uh, first, excluding the CRA. The after when the after nineteen hundred resolution, we have our new we have our new uh, annual gross. When we have that new annual gross, then we will look for us use our annual gross to arrive at our the new annual gross to arrive at our CRA. Then after arriving at the CRA, they will use a new uh, annual gross less the CRA to get our taxable income. I don't know if I'm in line with what you've done. Just like a form of to just like give my own understanding about what you have done so far. Okay, thank you very much. So um, let me just bring a clarity to that. So the old finance act and the new finance act, all of this, you will still do all of this. You will still have your um, annual gross income, the same method, the same way we've done here. If there is NHF in the old finance act, you would also still deduct it. You would deduct it to get your new gross income. But where the difference is, is that when you are applying your consolidated relief allowance of 20%, the old finance act still take cognizance of the, um, adjusted, I mean, the annual gross income. So the old finance act, irrespective of whether you have your new gross income, it doesn't take into consideration your new gross income in calculating your consolidated relief allowance. It still takes yeah. into consideration your annual gross income. That is what yeah. the old finance act does. So, but the new finance act takes into consideration the new gross income in calculating your consolidated relief allowance. That is for the 20% of it. So for the old finance act, where they use the new gross income, old finance act, where they mostly um, use the new gross income is when they want to calculate your taxable income. When they want to calculate your taxable income, they still use your new, um, gross income and take out your relief allowance to calculate your, your taxable income. But they do not use it for in calculation of your relief, your relief allowance. So the reason why the new finance act made adjustment to that is as a result of double relief. So the, 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 the which I've explained earlier, the, the, the argument was you can be, you can be charging relief on annual gross income that you have already taken into consideration regulatory payment because these regulatory payments are also benefits to the employee and relief is also a benefit to the employee so when you when you when you do not take consideration of pension nhif um, NH, um, nhf to get your new gross income when you are not taking consideration of the new gross income you are still basing your relief on the annual gross income that is here. It means you are, you are giving that um, employee too much relief. That employee is enjoying too much, more than what he or she is supposed to be enjoying. So the tax authority or the, the Personal Income Tax Act look at this um, um, computation and then discover that the double taxation or the double relief that the employee is giving should be managed. And that is why adjustment was made such that your 20% of um, your consolidated relief should be on the new gross income, which is excluding every other regulatory deduction that you must have taken out on behalf of that employee. So it doesn't mean that the old um, act, you are not, you won't take out all of this deduction. The difference between the old act and the new act 
is in the computation of your 20%, your 20% consolidated relief. The old ad says that it should be on the adjust or the annual gross income, but the new ad said it must be on the new gross income after deduction of your pension, NHIF, um, NHF, as the case may be. That is just the difference. The same thing is being done in terms of the processes and all of that, but just the computation aspect is where the difference act comes in for PIT. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Very, very clear. All right. Alyssa. Alyssa. Okay, go ahead. Um, consigning um, this um, pension and tax that is being paid. Where is it? Please, can, you, can you speak up a little so I can hear you? I said pension. I listen to that. I can't hear you clearly. Concerning the pension, sir, can you hear me clearly? Sir? Okay, I can hear you now. Go ahead. Concerning pension and tax payable, why is it that the tax that is being paid to government is always higher than the pension, the the pension that the staff is supposed to enjoy? Okay, thank you very much. So, um, it's you would always have a. Um, situations like that because your pension is as you earn you know the more your the more you the more your annual gross income is the more your eight percent will also be on that annual gross income and don't forget when to get your taxable pay you would have deducted a lot of relief you would have deducted a lot of uh, regulatory payments and all of that so that is why by the time you now calculate your PIT, your your um, your monthly pay is is even in this case we even have monthly pay that is more than your pension. So it's yeah, not that one, you know, that it's not okay. So your question is that why is this one higher than this one? Yes, why is PE always higher than pension? And that is that is it's it's your calculation now. It's not. Um, there is no um, stipulated this thing that um, your payee or your pension must be higher. It is whatever you compute based on the earnings of that particular staff. Well, if, you check the if you check the second one, the second, the second employer is higher than them. Um, see, let me see. You can see. Pay. Okay. You hmm. can see the second employer now. Pension is higher than payee. Exactly. Well, it was because I just said something about Okay, okay, it could be because of that 10,000 error you deducted. It's because of that um, stuff you adjusted, that 300, that uh, what are you calling it? 10,000 error for the... Which one? Abstentive. That one yeah, you adjusted. 10, this 10,000 error. Uh, remove no, that 10,000 error. No, it's not, not that, that 10,000 error. It's one thing you adjusted in the front. This is, this is monthly pay. Our our taxable pay is, on, is this. So the reason why that could be is because this particular staff is earning more. You know, pay the more you earn, the more you pay. No, you adjusted something in the front, sir. I adjusted what? I just said, um, you kept 300 one place. You removed it and you input 300. I've forgotten that part. I think is um when you're explaining um is it net is it new gross income? When you're explaining something, you Typed in three hundred thousand. So uh, yes, now that one is that one is normal. That one is normal for you to normal for you to deduct. So don't don't um, overwork yourself on um, why is that? Why is that? It's it's a law. So whatever your computation arrives at, that is what it should be. So if if um, you know for your pension, let me just put a, a little bit into that. For your pension, your pension is. 8% on your annual gross. And your annual gross, you've not taken out anything from it. So you might have an instance where it could be higher. And in this case, for this second staff now, the staff is actually earning more. You know, so pay is the more you earn, the more you pay. 
So this tap is actually earning more, and that is like is any close to times two of what close to times two of what this first employer or first employee is earning. So definitely, when you join some of those things together, you should expect in this regard for some changes. So, but never, nevertheless, there is no um, there is no stipulation or there is no standard that says pay, pension payment should be higher than PE payment. PE payment should be higher than pension payment. It is whatever computation that you've calculated on behalf of that particular staff that you should remit to the tax or the necessary authority. Okay, thank you, sir. Sir, it must it be that all income must all income be taxed in a situation whereby you were given over time, and they still tax it. And in fact, you know, like you said, the the more you earn, the uh, the higher your pay. It must it be because if you are paying in some organization, they pay leave allowance, they pay sometimes they pay over time, they pay bonuses, and all of these things are still taxed. Is this stipulated in a law like that to be taxing all allowances? Yes. So the, the law says that all bonuses, allowances, uh, 13th months, every other thing, because they form part of the employee emolument. They form part of the, the benefit that the employee is getting in that organization. So they are all taxed. So whether you are paid bonuses at the end of the year, you are paid 13th month at the end of the year, you would be taxed. The only instance, of course, there are, there are instances like, for example, now, maybe leave allowance. The, for, for leave allowance, you know, taxation is very, very wide. And for you to, for you to um, take advantage of the law, you need to know the law. So for leave allowance, most company, what they will charge for leave allowance is that normally on the norms, leave allowance is taxed. But when leave allowance is not above 10% of the basic salary of an employee, it should not be taxed. Of course, it is only when you know this that you can do this. So most employee, what they do is that if they want to pay you your leave allowance, they are going to calculate, they will multiply your basic salary times 12. Your, your basic salary would be times 12. Then they are going to now take 10% of it. That is what they are going to pay as your leave allowance to that particular staff. So when it is below 10% or 10% equal or below 10%, that particular leave allowance will not be taxed. But when a company applies more than 10% to that leave allowance, it should be taxed. So. It is only those who knows this law that applies the law to, to beat the law. So that's why most companies, they will restrict their leave allowance to 10% of your basic salary for the year. So, but it is not a law that you should charge 10%. Leave allowance is based on company policy. It's based on what the policy of the company is. Whatever the company has determined to pay as leave allowance. Some companies are so generous that they can pay you your full salary as your leave allowance. They can pay you your full basic salary for the, for the whole year as your leave allowance, whichever works for the company. But what most companies do in order to avoid tax is that they, they charge 10% of your 12 month basic salary. When it is below 10% or equal 10%, it won't be charged to tax. But when it is above 10%, it would be charged to tax. So all of those things, your allowances, your bonuses, your 13th month, and every other profit sharing that you enjoy, companies pay tax on their behalf. Okay. Oh, thank excuse you. me, sir. I, I got that. But in a situation... Can, can, I, can I just finish so that we can ask questions? Let me just quickly explain okay. the posting. Let's take out questions at the end of this class. Is it okay, fine? Sir. So that yeah, I won't fine, lose, fine. I won't lose my um, thought on on um, this posting. So when I finish, just pen down your question. When I finish the class, we can take any uh, question afterwards. Let me just quickly explain this so we would, we would assimilate everything together, and then we we'll fully understand how how this is being done. Now, one thing you should always note is that salaries are 
liabilities to companies because whether you like it or not whether you whether you pay you make revenue you make profits your salary is already budgeted for and that is why when you are preparing your budget every year your staff costs is part of the budget that you would pay you would budgeted for and because you have budgeted for it it's a liability it has become a liability on behalf of the company so whether the company makes profit or not you must pay your staff so when it comes to payroll management there are two um, entries that must be passed there are two entries that must be passed so the first entry is regarding the budgeted salary and that is that forms the liability so every month you must budget for your pay your, pay, your salary payment every month if your company is up to date every month you must budget or keep record of the amount of amount of um, salaries that you are going to pay at the end of the year at the end of the month rather so the first um, entries that you are to pass is let's assume let's assume um let's go back to this calculation that we did let's go back to this calculation that we did for this particular staff our gross income is 2.4 because what will be budgeted is the gross salary of every staff so let's take a particular staff for instance 2.4 so you are going to debit you know salary you also have and is an expense and according to the rules of trial balance all expenses are meant to be debited all expenses are meant to be what to be debited they have a debit balance so at the end of the month before your salary is paid the first entry you have to pass is to debit your salary account you debit your salary account with the gross amount of that particular staff you debit your gross your salary account with 2.4 which is expense and then you credit your salary payable depending on the ledger that you are using for your company so it's a payable because it's a liability it's a liability that must be fulfilled at the end of the month by the um, company and according to the rules of um, accounting or the rules of trial balance all liabilities must have what a credit a credit balance now at the, at the end of the month when payment is now made at the end of the month when payment is now made that is after you've paid staff and all of that the next thing is to is to net off this your salary payable because it's no longer for that particular month you are no longer owing the company is no longer owing the company has paid the company has paid what they are meant to pay so just reverse that particular um, liability account. So you would debit your salary payable with that 2.4. You debit your salary payable with 2.4. And you will credit. Now, in this case now, all the pay, um, regulatory deduction that was made, you would have your ledger for them all the ledger that all the deductions your pension your payee your nhif whatever deductions that you are doing you must have a ledger that keeps record of what you pay at the end of every month such that at the end of every year when you are now closing your book you will be able to reconcile what you paid and what you were supposed to pay such that maybe when the tax authority come and they say oh you are not if you are not compliant and all of that you can go back to your record and check what you have actually paid so you must have a ledger account for every payment that is remitted to your tax or regulatory body so in this case now for this particular client because it has been splitted so you go back to you go to your pension 
because we are dealing with gross now. You go to your gross. Our monthly gross is, our monthly um, pension is 328. So you will debit, you will debit that account. You, I mean, you will credit your pension with that amount, 328. Is that what? 328. 328, our payee. So our payee now, no, our pension is, this is what we are using. Our pension is 192. Our pension is 192. And then our pay, our payee is um, our payee for the year is where is our payee? Our payee is um, okay. So our payee is two one seven six six six. So let me copy this, and you credit your payee account, depending on the ledger that you have um, put or you are using for your company. And then our bank, our bank is now your net, our annual net, our annual net, that is what you are paying, your, our annual net. This is our annual net. So when, when you add this together, when you add all of this together, it must give you, it must give you your gross salary. So let's add all of these together. It must give you your gross, your gross salary. So this is the breakdown of how your posting should be before the month and after the month. So beginning of the month, where you account for your salary, your gross salary, you your gross salary, you debit it, which is your expenses. You debit your salary account with the amount, and then your payables, your salary payables account, you credit it with the amount. So at the end of the month, when payment is now made, that is, you've paid your staff your salary, you are now going to debit your salary payable account, and then you credit all relevant deduction that was made and then you credit your bank because you are making your payments from the bank, which is an outflow. So you credit your bank with the net payments or the net, um, the net annual pay for that staff with the net tax and also net um, pension. So whichever way you do it, if you are using gross, if you are using net, you will get the same thing. Now let's assume, let's assume, you know, we have used an example of net, of gross. Let's assume we are making use of what net. Let's do another example here, wherein we are making use of the net, net payment. So what you will do is your monthly gross, your monthly gross, which is 200,000, your monthly gross, 200,000, is what you will post here. That will be your gross salary, 200,000. Then your payables account too will be 200,000. So in that month, this is what we are to pay that staff. So when you come to, after the after month end, when payment has been made, you would come here, you debit, so you debit, you credit. Debit, you credit. So now here you debit, here you credit, you credit, you credit. So you you credit you debit your salary payable with two hundred thousand, and then you debit you credit your pay, your payee payables with what's our monthly payee for this particular staff. 
so you credit your monthly payee you go to your calculation you our monthly payee is this also you credit your pension your monthly pension your monthly pension is this So once you have that, you will credit your bank with your net pay, your monthly, your monthly net pay. So this is your monthly net pay, which um, is this. So that will give us this amount. So once if you add up everything, it must account or give you your gross pay for the month. So that should give us our 200,000 200, um, Naira. So whichever way you are accounting for it at your place of work, whether it is on a monthly basis, whether it is on a yearly basis, for each of your staff, this is how your journal entry should be. So before the month end, don't forget, you are making two entries. Beginning of the month, you set it as an expense while you also make it a liability. While at the end of the month, when payment has been made, you offset or you net off your payables account with the amount and then you will credit all relevant deduction. If any check was done, you will credit it. If any deduction, penalty, fines and all of that, you will credit it and then you will credit your bank with your net payment. Once you do that, you are very, very accurate with your hosting. So that is that about how pension management or payroll management is being, is being done. So uh, let me take your question. Let me just take um, three questions because of our time. Um, OK, Let's go ahead with your question. Yeah, good evening. My yeah. question is um, my question is in a situation whereby uh, you you know sometimes you just feel like you you just feel like uh, you want to not that you want to manipulate accounts not that you want to evade tax but not that you want to avoid tax rather but in a situation whereby you want to capitalize on the loopholes like tax evasion. In that that's regard, what? how can yes, tax evasion? All right. Yes, yes. Uh, you want to capitalize on the loopholes in the area of tax as regards to this um, salary payment. How can someone go about that? How what advice can you give to so that you will not be charging higher tax for some people? You know, you just feel like okay, you need to uh, work on some adjustments, and it will not it will not backfire on you uh, at the, on the long run, but how can someone capitalize on that loophole so that you will not be giving too much of tax to the tax authority? And, um, and okay. the second question is, in a situation whereby you um, you engage external consultants, you know, there are some organizations that engage external consultants, they make payment to them. They make payment to them. So it is those consultants that will now, they will send them the schedule. They will send them the schedule, they make payment to the consultant. So it is now the consultant that will now distribute the payments. In that regards, how can you record such transactions? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. So the first question, if I get your question clearly, how to avoid tax legally? So, um, so this is this, the recommendation on how to pay lesser tax that is in line with compliance is that you would engage in more of pension contribution. You know, pension contribution is not restricted to 8% alone for employees. 8% alone is just the minimum that an employee should pay by the law. So you can decide to increase your pension for that employee. You can decide to charge, for instance, 
you can decide to charge 20% of pension for employee if the employee agrees to that. The reason is because when you charge higher pension, it is still the employee that will enjoy the pension in the long run. You know, when you retire, you are still the one that will enjoy the benefit of that pension. But in the short time, what it will do is that it's going to reduce your tax, your taxable income. Let me give you an instance in this calculation now. In this calculation now, we use 8%. Let's assume we want to avoid payee cap, we want to avoid payment of tax. We don't want to pay higher tax. And we don't want to do that by doing it illegally. We want to do it legally. We want to take advantage of the law. And pension is a minimum of 8% for employee. It's not all. There is something we call voluntary contribution. You can also advise your employee to embark on voluntary contribution. Voluntary contribution is that the employee can give an order to the employer to take certain amount from their, month, from their um, income every month and remit it to their pension account. It's one of the ways of reducing tax liability. Voluntary contribution is one of the ways of reducing tax liability. Okay. Another okay. way is to increase your pension amount. You can, if, if all the employees agree that, okay, let the company be taking 20%, they know that that money is still their own, but it's not an immediate benefit. They will enjoy it in the later on. Let's assume in this calculation now, we are doing 20%. 20% would have been 0 0.2. 0 0.2 now will give us pension of 480,000. So it means that our new gross will change. Our new gross will change to 1,920,000, um, which initially, initially it was 2.2. So let's assume we have applied that. We have applied that and our new gross is now 1.2. Now take out your relief, 200,000, 20% of your new gross. That gives us this. Our taxable income, our taxable income is now this 1 million, 1 million 336,000. Now let's now apply this 1 million 336,000 on our PIT rates. First 300 is this. Next 300. <inaudible> Please, if you are entering the class, please unmute your mic so we can hear ourselves. So let's assume, let's take out first 300 is this. So it means our taxable income, which is this amount, when you less 300 from it, when you less 300 from it, it will reduce. I want to show you how to by court, pay, how to pay lesser tax legally. So less 300,000. So it means we have this. So our next 300,000 from it, it means we have this. So our next 500,000 from it, it means we have this. So the next 500,000, which in this case is not up to, is not up to, um, what we have now is, what we have now is this 236,000. 236,000. Thank you. What we have now is 236,000 multiplied by how many percent is that now? That is um, 19%, right? Yes. 19%. So that will give us 44,000. So it means our, our taxable pay, It means our tax liability now. Ah, oh, sorry. I'm supposed to do it here. It means this is where I'm supposed to do the calculation. Our two to six thousand times nineteen percent. That will give us our taxable pay. So in this case now we have nothing. We have nothing here. We have nothing. So this summation of this, we have exhausted our 
taxable income so we have exhausted our taxable so when you add all of this together our taxable income would be 100 and our taxable income would be 173,840. 173,840. So that would be our tax payable. Our tax payable has reduced to 173,840. 173,840. So that's our tax payable. So our monthly payee now will now be this. Our, our monthly payee rather will now be this, 14,486,000. You can see it's lesser than what we were supposed to pay initially. Is that not so? Yes, yes, is it, yes. Is it lesser? Yes. So you can see that legally speaking we have avoided paying a lot of tax so it has to so that has to do with um, you having a, a a kind of collaboration with your employee and letting them understand the the nitty-gritty of what you are doing that this money is not that you are taking it for your own pocket but you just want to help them to reduce their tax liability and how to do that is by getting more of pension payment such that at the end of their retirement, because gradually what they are doing is that they are saving for their future. So that at the end of their retirement, they can have enough money to, 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 to enjoy themselves and they will be paying lesser tax as at now. So another ways you can also reduce tax liability legally is by voluntary contribution. Like so voluntary contribution, the employees like saying that. Ah, they... ma, you know, my labor. I'm Hello. Ma, ma, ma. Please, can you mute yourself? So, voluntary contribution, the employee saying that take 50,000 naira from my salary and put it into my pension account. That's another way. Another way you can also um, avoid or pay lesser tax. Is when you engage in other statutory deductions. For instance, now, NHIF, NHF, and all of that. When you engage in other statutory deduction, it will reduce your tax liability. Don't forget, you are still the one enjoying all this NHIF, NHF. You are still the one enjoying it, but it's just another kind of um, benefit that you will enjoy that is not a form of monetary monetary terms and then which other way um legally speaking um that you can you can avoid paying lesser tax apart from these ones that i've mentioned um i think that is what i can think for now except if anybody has other things that can be done legally speaking to pay lesser tax but i hope that answers your question yes sir Elisa. So let me quickly answer your second question. Your second Elisa. question is um, what's your second question again? Can you remind me? Okay, go ahead. Elisa. Yeah, go ahead. That voluntary contribution one is making to the pension. Hello, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can ask. I can hear you. Are you the one that asked the first question? Yes, yes. I want, I'm the one that asked the first what's question. This, what's the second question again? The second question is as it goes to. Um, uh, okay, you said you were at source, Abby. Yes, at source. Yes, yes. Okay, so in that case, whatever payment that was done by the outsourcing company, of course, they are going to give you a report. The outsourcing company will give you a report of what was done every year, except if it is the outsourcing company that is managing your books for you. But if the outsourcing company is just in charge of your 
salary payment and other deductions. They are going to give you a report of deductions that was made from the account of the employee. So once you have that deduction, you will, you would post accordingly into your journals and your ledger. So get the report from the, the agent, look at the reports. Of course, what the salary, what the agent will pay is it will, it will be based on your instruction. You too, you would have, you would have a knowledge of what they are to pay or what they are to remit to every employee. So you would have the knowledge. So that, that won't stop your posting in the beginning of the month. That won't stop you recognizing it as an expense and also as a liability because you also have an idea of what would be paid. So but at the end of the month, get the report for them so that you will know if accurately those deductions were captured and the outsourcing agent are also in compliance with tax laws. So once you've see, discovered that they are in compliance, you can now take your um, you can now take that report and post accordingly. You can as well decide to to wait to the end of the month before you post, but that is not advisable since you know what the outsourcing agent because the outsourcing agent cannot pay beyond what you have instructed them to pay. It is what you tell them to pay that's what they will pay. So you already have an idea of what would be paid to every employee. So that won't stop your posting in the beginning of the month. But if you want to confirm at the end of the month, before you post the second transaction, get a report from them and then you post accordingly. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I have gotten that. Thank you, God bless you. All right, Techno, your question. Hello, sir. Yeah. Um, the voluntary contribution one is making to the pension um, collector. Let me use that English. At the time someone is going to enjoy it, we did not take tax. We did not tax the voluntary contribution. What do you say? The voluntary contribution one is making now. Yes. At the time of the retirement. We did not tax the uh, voluntary contribution at the time of collection from the pension. No, you, you, you don't charge tax on pension. No, you know, it's not a pension again. It's a voluntary, it's a voluntary contribution. I'll be mean, a pension again. No, it's part of your, it will form part of your pension account because the one you remit, the 8% you remit to PFAs is what we call mandatory contribution, otherwise yes. known as pension. So it's yes. mandatory because it is a law. So, but the okay. voluntary contribution is also pension, but it is voluntary in the sense that it is the employee that gives the instruction. So everything together, the mandatory contribution plus your voluntary contribution will form all the amounts that you will collect at the end of your retirement. So it's not taxable. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, excuse me, sir. All right, go ahead. Uh, okay, my thing, the question I, I want to ask is that uh, the likes of this voluntary contribution that is not tax stable, and as well as maybe some the leave allowance that is actually uh, below the ten percent of our uh, annual basic salary. Now, in our payroll, in our payroll, if we have our payroll now. Is it that where are we going to like uh, fit them in to just show that okay, this is a leave allowance, this is a vote necessarily affect the computation that was being done? So, how are we going to like, is it that it's going to come along with the reliefs or it will come after? Okay, thank you very much. So, in order to have a clean um, payroll sheet. It will not, your leave allowance, for instance, would not be part of would not be part of uh, this calculation that we've done. But you can have a sheet that would formularize your leave allowance. It's very simple. For instance, now I can just create a sheet here. Depending on how you have structured your payroll sheet, it could be horizontal, it could be vertical, whichever way, and. 
you can create it anywhere. So for me now, I can come here, I can come here and create a column. I can create a column here and say this is leave allowance payment. Leave allowance payment. So you so that just to help you know what you will pay. So with this, you can calculate your leave allowance to be your basic multiplied by 12, your basic salary multiplied by 12, your basic salary multiplied by 12. Then times times 10, times 10 percent. 10 percent is a uh, sorry, um, basic is 0.1. That's zero point one. That should be giving us something like six hundred thousand. So that will be giving us that will be giving us six hundred thousand. So you can just have a formula here that captures this. It's very straightforward for everybody. It's the same formula you are using for all employees. So just drag it down for all employee that you have. It would automatically calculate your basic salary for your, your leave allowance for that employee. So it's very simple to do, but just note that it won't form part of this, your payroll computation. Not, not rather, okay. you can have it in a column beside your computation that will capture what so that you will know what you will pay as leave allowance when the time comes to your staff. So, but it will form part of your payroll calculation. All right. Okay. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, it's clear. yeah, yeah very clear. Do we have? Let me take one more questions before we call it a day. Last yeah, question. Hello, good evening. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah, good evening. <laughs> Okay, just go on, go on, go on. Okay, okay, good evening, thank you. So I have two questions actually. One of them is on the journal postings and the other one is on the calculations. So on the journals, I don't quite understand the logic behind booking the salaries payable at the beginning of the month. Because I think that's based on the assumption that we know exactly how much is going to be, but there are cases where maybe there are new staffs that were, that were added during the month. So that will also require a new posting. So I'm thinking, I don't necessarily understand why we have to do it at the beginning of the month. Plus it's also, where, as if you are recognizing the expense before we actually incurred it because the staff have not actually worked for that period. All right, thank you very much. Okay, okay. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Omoni. Uh, sorry okay. to cut you short, please. <laughs> Um, I really appreciate all what you've been doing and for your time all along. But please, I think um, at the period when we started, I was having an issue with um, network. So there was at the point when you got to these um, consolidated um, calculations, do so I got it up to the annual gross income? But I don't know, possible, possible before we end the session, if I can get, I, I understand that for the first installment for that's for if the if the salary is more than two hundred thousand, or if it's lower than two hundred thousand, then they can't work one percent on it. Then for salary that is higher than two hundred thousand, then that is fixed for two hundred thousand. Then I think for the next one is twenty percent of the gross income. So I think the next one after that I can't vividly remember, but I think um uh, is it not going to be like the annual gross income minus the first consolidated, then the second twenty percent. Then before we now. Then there was a place where you got the taxable income for the year or something like that also. I I really don't get that place where then at the point where we're using uh, on the percentage 0.19 if you died on 500 then for the next 500 for the next 300. So please sir, if if possible time permit if you can just take it or anyhow. All right, so no that, problem. That's, that's my own question. Thank you, sir. All right. I would let me let me quickly answer this question. I will yes. just have a brief talk on your own question. So why you need to um, account for your your uh, 
salary is that your salary is a liability to the company. And as a liability, it must be recognized. So let's say, for instance, now you have new staff that will definitely join in. Of course, when you are preparing your budget, budget encompasses the likely things that are going to happen. When management sits to prepare budgets, the budget is not just prepared alone for staff that are present. The, the HR, if your company, if it is the HR that is in charge of employment, which definitely is, the HR will also prepare their own budget. And that budget for the HR will capture employees that are likely going to be employed in the course of the year. And they are likely pay. That is why employ when you go for interviews sometimes, employer will tell you, this is our budget for this room. It is because they have already budgeted the amount that they are going to pay that particular employee that is coming on board for the room. So let's assume the HR has discovered that, okay, maybe in this course of the year, we are not going to employ more than 20 people or at most 20. And based on the position, this position is 200,000, we are going to pay this person. This position is 300,000, we are going to pay this person. Once the employee uh, the HR department brings the budget, the account team would take cognizance of the number of what employer employee that will be bring, brought on board for that particular year, together with the present staff. That is what the master budget would entail. So the master budget would entail both what will likely happen and the ones that would happen. So if at the end of the day, there is an adjustment, let's say for instance, let's say for instance, of course, you know, what I did here is just one individual. So let's say for instance, there is an, ad, we want to make, um, um, we want to make entries for two individuals, a particular individual that is just joining us in this month. How much is he earning? It's very simple. If the staff is earning 200,000 monthly, go back and prepare his, pay, his um, payroll. Prepare his payroll on the way you have prepared for every other staff. And then if you are preparing for two staff, add up the two gross income for the two staff. The two gross income for the two staff will form your gross salary that will be debited into this place. And then the liability of each, the two staff also is what you are going to account for because you need to account for it because it's a liability on, on the part of the company. Whether the company makes profit or not, won't they pay your salary? They will pay your salary. So you will not say on, until they pay you before you would account for it. When you do that, your books, you will not be accounting accurately. You would not be accounting accurately. Your books will not show the true picture because by the time, by the time they want to check your books, maybe in the, in the middle of the month, by the time they want to check your book, anybody that is checking your book that understands the rules must definitely know that there is a liability that this company must should and there is a liability that should should be showing on the assets on the liability on the current liability of that particular company which is salary salary is the major thing that you will see there aside if there is any other liability that the company has incurred but for your salary it must be there whether you like it or not you must pay your salary so it's a, it's a law or it, let me say it's not a law per se, but it's the principle of accounting to, to ensure that you have an accurate picture of your books, the true position of what your book entails. Because if you don't do this, definitely that means that what do you want to post at the end of the month? So at the end of the month, you just want to post your, you just want to post your, you want to post it into gross salary, and then you post the separate account into their respective places. What about the liability before you post? 
Don't forget, it's not that this liability will still be there after you have paid. It would have net off. That is why we are debiting. You can see we credited the first entry. We credited the salary payables, but in the second entry after payment has been made, we debited it. It means that our, our payables account, our salary payables account at the end of the month will be zero. It will be zero. It means that at the end of the month, whosoever is looking at our book, we know that yes, we have settled the liability for that particular month. There is nothing that is showing. But if somebody is picking our books at the end of the, uh, in the middle of the month and is not seeing a liability, is not seeing a salary liability that the company is supposed to pay employees, definitely that's not the true position of your books. So this is the accurate way of posting your payees and your payroll calculation. I hope my explanation is clear. Yes, very, very. Yes, it's clear. I, Thank I, you. I think I get the general entry. So it doesn't stop That's whether true. you are adding five people joining us. Those five people have been projected for. So once the five people come on board, add the five people to your posting. Shikena, you move on. Five next three people join us. Add it to whoever is joining. Go and calculate their pay, their payroll. Add it and post. Your liability will still net off. It's not that your liability will still be showing at the end of the month, it will still be showing 2.4. If your liability is still showing 2.4 at the end of the month after you have paid salary, definitely you have not posted the other leg of transaction. You have not debited that particular salary payment. So you need to debit it so that your liability for salary will be showing zero. And then if there is liability for any other thing, that is what will be in your liabilities account. But for your salary payable, it must be zero after every month because you have paid, you have paid that salary to the um, staff. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> on the second question, it's on actually on the calculations on the calculation. So can you just go to that sheet on the calculation sheet? Where okay, I so I've not done. The... Yes, yes, this sheet. So I've not done payroll before, but I'm a bit familiar with Excel. And I was thinking, is it possible for us to maybe make this kind of like a a one? Can we want formulas to do these computations for us, where we just maybe put in the basic salary or the annual gross, and then we have formulas to, for the other I'm ones? Not get, I'm like, not getting your question clearly. Like, can we run? Like, can we actually just run formulas to do some of this come up? This computations for us because it looks like if you, every time you have a new staff, you actually have to do these computations like each by each. Like you have to do the NHL and all of those ones. But can we just run formulas for even yes, the of course. tax payables? You can run formula. You can run formula to that. So if you if you know how to if you know how to use um, Excel very well, you can okay. freeze all of this um, formula. And then you will just use it for any staff that you are bringing on board. So, of course, you can okay. have a formula fixed for all of them. It's the same thing. So you can have a formula fixed for your PIT rate. It's the same thing. Just ensure that you accurately capture everything that um, you are supposed to capture the rates and balance. So, in this case, you will need formula like if if greater than if less than freezing um, your dollar sign you freeze or so if you need a template on if you want us to help us structure um, a sheet for you that you can use at your place of work wherein you don't need to do any other calculation you just um, you just want to impute the amount and it will calculate itself based on what you do just um, private chat me after the class and uh, we'll, we'll find a way around that. So, but right. you can use definitely, you can be doing this for one after the other. If you work in a place where you have a lot of staff, what will be helpful for you is formulas. So you will need it. Thank you. So let me answer this question from um, one of us before we call it a day. 
Um, I think you were referring to, uh, please, the person that asked that question, can you come again with your question? I think you were referring yeah. to the new gross income, right? Um, yeah, um, well, what I was saying was that I got the explanation up to where we got the new gross income when we removed the pension, the NHF and the housing and the health also from the okay. annual gross income. Then at the time we got to the consolidated uh, consolidated relief allowance, that was where I wasn't getting it as well. But I understand that for the first for the first two on for the, I think the it is in, it's in stages of I think five or four, whereby the first one for the highest income in terms of either two hundred thousand or but what I want to first know is that okay, when okay let's assume let's assume we are using the first example of one point of one point of one million nine hundred twenty thousand. Okay, now, so is it that we'll divide this 1,920,000 into stages or we'll first remove the first 200,000 from 190,000 and since uh, it's higher than 200, since the gross income is higher than 200,000, then 200,000 for that one. Then the second stage, then we charge 20% of the of that 1,920,000. Then by the time we are getting to this taxable income, the taxable I was getting, I wasn't getting it at all. And you know, there was a calculation you also did underneath where we have, I think like five stages where we also have 500,000 at 500,000 and so. So I want to get out that calculation, how we can do that calculation before we arrive at this net monthly. That, that was where I was mixing it up. So if all you right. can just help to just shed more light time. All right, thank you very much. So yes, sir, thanks. what we did was, once you arrive at this, you calculate for your consolidated relief allowance, which is higher of 200,000 or 1% of annual gross income. So we don't just pick 200,000, we also compare the 1% of annual gross income. So let's compare our 1% of annual gross income. That is 1% of annual gross income. Annual gross income yes. is, is this, that is 2.4. So 1% of it is 24,000. So higher of 200,000 or 24,000, which one are you going to pick? The law says you should pick the higher of the two. That is, that is um, 200,000. That is, that is 200,000. So that is why we have the 200,000 here. So we have the 200,000 here. Which is, the, which is higher than 24,000, 1% of it. That's why we pick 200,000. Plus 20%, which is 20% of 1920, and that is why we have this. So to get our taxable income, you will less all the relief from your new gross income. So that is your 1920 minus 200,000 minus 384,000 would have a balance of one, 36, 1,336,000. That is what will form our taxable income. So this is the income that will be subjected to tax. So once you, once you arrive at this particular place, we call it taxable income. So this is the tax, this is the income that will be subjected to tax. So now you will now apply your personal income tax rate. So applying your personal income tax rate, it means first 300 will be subjected at 7%. That will give us 21,000. So we need to have a balance. So this minus, minus this amount, which is the first 300, our balance is this. This is what we have left that we should be taxed. So we are also going to tax the next 300 at 11%. That, is, that will give us 33,000, but our balance will now be this one minus the 300,000, that is 736. So we will do the next 500 at 15%, that will give us 75,000. So once you take the 500 from your 736, you are going to be left with 236. So the law now says the next 500, the next 500 should be subjected to 21, um, 19%, 19%. And that money, if what, what is left is not up to 500,000. 
it's what we left what we have left is 236 so that 236 is what we are going to subject to 19 percent so that is why we have this multiplied by 19 percent so we now have this so at this point we are we have exhausted all our taxable income so once we do that just sum everything up sum all the tax liability that we've computed here sum everything up that will give us 173,840. So that will give us our tax payable, which is what we have, what we have here. So in this case, apply your minimum tax, apply your deductions, you will get your answer. Uh, sorry, uh, Alyssa. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, minimum tax, 1% of annual gross. Okay. Okay, yeah, from the 2.4. That is before the new gross income. What do you say? Please speak up a little. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. This minimum tax, 1% of annual gross. Okay, that is the, uh, the annual gross before the new gross income, right? Yes, yes, the annual gross, yes. This one is called the new gross income. This one is called the annual gross. So it's this one we okay. use. Okay, so this 24,000 now, yeah, how did we now keep it? 1% so of the annual gross. 1% of the annual gross, that will give us minimum tax. That is 24,000. Okay, then the annual net pay now, um, how did we get it? Like we remove we remove from what and what and what that's what I'm, you can you can put your arrow there possibly maybe you can see the formula. Hello, you the next pay. Yes. Are yes. you asking me for this? Yes. Yes. How we got? How we and got so it? this one is your new gross income minus okay your taxable. Liability, yeah, your pay. taxable pay. Okay. So this one, your new gross income, which is this, minus yes. your tax payable that you've computed here, that will give you your annual net pay. Can you see that? Okay, sir. Okay, okay thank you, sir. So much, Mr. Amoni. Can you please Am share this file with us on the group? Can you okay, please share this okay. file with yes. us on the WhatsApp, sir? Yeah, I think you said he's going to share it. Yes, I will share it. I will share the. Uh, I'll share the video on our page so that okay. everybody can go back and listen to it. And then I'll share okay. the file too with, uh, I'll drop it on WhatsApp so that we can all okay. have it as a template. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. So, thank you for your time. We have come to thank the you. end of um, today's class on um, payroll management, pay calculations and journal entries. I hope it is um, very, very insightful. And um, we have all gotten one or two things um, added to us. So um, this is word of accounting professionals. And um, part of what we do here is we render accounting services, trainings, ICANN lectures, business consultants, business plan, and then every other um, auditing, tax, tax consultancy, and all of that. We render them and we offer them as services here. And then um, part of this is what we have outlined that we are going to achieve this year. There are lots of trainings that are coming up very soon. Some of them, you will get to find out about them. And some of them, you also see the flyers when we are about to to go about it. So just stay tuned. The, 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 major, the major objective of World of Accounting Professionals is to equip professional accountants with the necessary skill and capacity so that they can excel at their various place of work. You know, so if you stay tuned to what we do on the page, I tell you, you don't need to have worked in certain industries or certain sectors if you if you if you are constant with information that is being posted into that group, 
you would have gotten vast experience. And I'm talking about practical experience. And what we are also going to be doing as trainings will also be practical trainings, trainings that will help you on your job. You know, very soon we'll be having a training shortly. Um, I will communicate that with the rest of, uh, I will communicate that with everybody. It's very, very important. It's a training that I would not want anybody to miss out on, you know, so, but we nevertheless stay tuned to World of Accounting Professionals. If you need any personal training on anything that is bothering you, anything that's, you know, it's maybe it's an hindrance at a place of work, you need clarification, feel free to reach out to professional colleagues in the group. You can also reach out to me and we'll definitely do justice to that. So thank you very much for attending today's class. Um, I'll make the recordings available to everybody on our WhatsApp, on our YouTube page. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page as you watch any videos that is being posted here. So thank you very much and have a lovely weekend. Bye for now. Yes. Hello, sir. So, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Good night. Yeah, good Hello, night, sir. everyone. God bless you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Good night. Yeah. Hello, Mr. Money. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I want to ask, do you have a WhatsApp group platform or Possibly yes, we have a WhatsApp. Are you not in our group platform? No, no, no. I, I got this meeting link through someone. So I just joined and this is my first time and I really, oh, really okay. All right. Just private chat so me. Far. Though our first WhatsApp group chat is filled up. So we have another WhatsApp group chat that is almost getting to fill up. So just private chat me. I'll send you the group chat link so you okay. can join. And sorry, sorry, please. I don't even have your phone contact, like your WhatsApp phone contact also. You don't have my contacts? Yeah, I don't have your WhatsApp contact also. My WhatsApp number? Uh, yeah, but I just followed you on LinkedIn just now. But I don't have your okay. WhatsApp Okay. Okay, send me a message on LinkedIn. Okay, just now. Okay, I will send you a message. Send me a message on LinkedIn. Or you can also drop your number on this chat box. Let me save it and I'll give you. I will send it to you. And also okay. chat you up. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a lovely night, first. You get my number. I'm dropping it now. Have you seen it, sir? Have you, have you dropped it? Okay, yes, yes. Emmanuel, right? Yes, Emmanuel. All right, let me save your number for me. Okay, I will send you the group link. You can also share it okay. with your professional colleagues, right. accountants, finance, sure. anybody in this industry that will be interested in what we do here okay. sure, so sir, that sure, they can sir. also benefit from it. So I've saved your number. I will chat you up. Thank you very much, sir. Um, very soon. Emmanuel. Okay, sir. Thanks, sir.